Melissa, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, morning. Dear Under Secretary General, Mrs. Melissa Fleming, dear colleagues, ambassadors, dear co the amb colleagues, uh, fellow diplomats at the UN, dear friends of media and information literacy, I am pleased and honored to welcome all of you to this thematic event on empowering of civil society in strengthening media and information literacy best practices and pathways for the future action within the Global Media and Information Literacy Week. At the start, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all co-organizers of this event, namely the EU delegation to the European Union, as well as the missions of Georgia, Jamaica, Japan, Namibia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Moreover, I would like to especially thank the UN Department of Global Communication and Mrs. Fleming, for very close cooperation with you and your office, including your moderating of this event. We have this event as a part of the Global Media and Information Literacy Week, the last week of October, organized by the UNESCO and supported by the member states. I'm particularly glad that on March 25th of this year, all 193 UN member states unanimously adopted the General Assembly's resolution on promotion of this week globally and raising the awareness of media and information literacy. For me, our event is about two main messages. First, it's about bringing together civil society organizations and so-called CSOs and the UN and its member states in our joint efforts to promote media and information literacy. CSOs are playing an important role in promoting media and information literacy worldwide as an effective tool to tackle disinformation and misinformation. Today, we will hear from the CSOs on some key lessons learned and on their recommendations. Secondly, we are all together in this effort to navigate in the modern media and information environment. It has gone through tectonic changes lately and amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Metaphorically speaking, media and information literacy is a vaccine against misinformation and dis disinformation. And our approach must be based on freedom of expression, solidarity, cooperation, and mutual trust. To conclude, Latvia is glad to contribute by sharing our national experience later on by Dr. Denis Alipnice, and on my own behalf, I would like to underline that Latvia will continue to address this information, misinformation, infodemia at the UN and other international fora as part of our contribution to better recovery, ensuring the sustainable development. I thank you all, and I wish all participants to have an enriching, stimulating discussion. And now I pass over to my colleague, Ambassador of Jamaica. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Andres. Uh, USG Fleming, uh, distinguished panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
Um, it, it's a particular honor for me to, to be able to present a few words to you today. It, it is my understanding that uh, Jamaica made the proposal at the UNESCO board for, uh, for this celebration of this week. Um, and this is being the first one, it's a particular honor for, for Jamaica. Um, the theme for today's event, Empowering Civil Society in Strengthening Media and Information Literacy, is not only timely, but necessary if we are to develop faster and more reliable fact-checking, higher standards and trustworthiness in information sharing. We have all experienced that today's information feed is endless. People are overwhelmed with data and information, and the dichotomy exists between what is real and what is fake. The sheer amount of available information inhibits the ability of the public to make informed decisions. Civil society organizations with their connections to the grassroots in society are well placed to provide leadership in media and information literacy, especially as we seek to empower the most marginalized among us. An occasion such as this provides all of us with the opportunity to build on existing efforts to enhance people's media and information literacy uh, as a means of countering the rise in disinformation and misinformation. The Verified Campaign is an excellent example of one such effort by the UN's Department of Global Communication to counter misinformation in respect of COVID-19, at the same time promoting international cooperation and solidarity. We look forward to the new phase of the campaign's pause initiative. We recognize that there is a critical role for us in promoting the dissemination of fact-based and reliable information. I therefore look forward to the discussions that will be generated by our esteemed panelists, and that information shared will build awareness and provide support for issues such as sustainable development, peace and security, as well as human rights. Thank you, and I wish for you a productive uh, uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Andres, and Excellencies, colleagues, and friends. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to this important discussion. I think we just heard a, a great introduction by the two M ambassadors, the PRs of, of Latvia and Jamaica, but I'd just like to remind you of the title. It's called Empowering Civil Society in Strengthening Media and Information Literacy. It is so urgent. Uh, my name is Melissa Fleming and I'm the Undersecretary General for Global Communications at the UN. And I've been really proudly leading the efforts to combat uh, misinformation. And so that's why it is just such an honor to moderate this event. Uh, and over the next hour and a half, we look forward to hearing lots of very, I'm sure, interesting perspectives about the role civil society can play in the global fight against mis- and disinformation. First, let me thank our co-sponsors today, the permanent missions of Georgia, Jamaica, Japan, Latvia, Namibia, New Zealand, and South Africa, as well as the delegation of the European Union. This discussion is part of what has become the annual Global Media and Information Literacy Week, which member states endorsed in a General Assembly resolution earlier this year. This week, it has become increasingly an important way for us to draw attention to the phenomenon of misinformation and disinformation and what we can and should do about it. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, recognized this as well in his landmark report on the future of the world, the common agenda, our common agenda. And in that report, he calls for the establishment of a global code of conduct to promote integrity in public information. And I look forward to leading the work stream and perhaps with many of you um, to reach such a code of conduct. And indeed, um, in that report, and I'd like to quote what the Secretary General said, he wrote that, quote, the ability to cause large scale disinformation and undermine scientifically established facts is an existential risk to humanity, an existential risk to humanity. That's how 
dramatic uh, the Secretary General thinks the situation is. I believe, I've been calling it a polluted media landscape, um, and one which we would need to push that, that uh, good content, uh, good content driven by your governments, driven by the United Nations can prevail. So this has been so obvious in the COVID-19 pandemic, which brought with it and a new term that we're all using, an infodemic um, of lies, distortion, and even hate speech uh, surrounding the virus, and then of course the vaccines. And those, those lies, those untruths have led to countless preventable deaths and also created or reinforced divisions and social grievances. And as we know, it's not just COVID-19. Uh, we also know that it is widespread in the debate about climate change and in numerous conflicts around the world. Hate speech has also been directly responsible for war and genocide. Knowing the power of misinformation led the UN to create the Verified Initiative, uh, which was referenced earlier. Uh, we created it about uh, 18 months ago already to help combat the COVID-19 infodemic. Uh, it aims to build, among other things, information literacy among the public by providing uh, accurate, engaging content about the virus and vaccines, but also giving the members of the public the tools to resist misinformation. I would like to thank member states, including many of those participating today, for their support of Verified. With that introduction, let's begin. We have great speakers today. Unfortunately, only, well, now less than 90 minutes to hear them, so can I ask all of our speakers to keep to their allotted time? And we invite our audience to write your questions in the chat box, and we will get them get to them if we have time, hopefully we will. The first part of our discussion today will be a panel on the role of journalists and citizens in addressing disinformation and misinformation and promoting reliable and accessible information online and offline. And for this segment, we have four speakers, Kashini Naratnum, BBC World TV anchor and editor and founder of globalnewsmakers.com and Alexandrite Global Communications. Also, Christina Tudarulu, journalist and founder of Agencia Lupa. Mina Dennert, journalist and founder of Hashtag I Am Here International. And Mia Milan, founding editor-in-chief of the Becky Sisha Center for Health Journalism. Let's start with Kashini Navarantanam, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, USG Fleming. It's a great honour to be here today, excellencies, colleagues and friends. Free and responsible journalists play an absolutely critical role in informing public opinion and holding those in power and influence to account. Journalism needs to challenge and question and to be empowered to do so, to find the truth. Journalism needs to embrace freedom of expression. The dissemination of the truth plays a vital role in creating fairer societies, where those who lead are challenged and malpractices and corruption are exposed. The truth is the most powerful way of countering disinformation. There is an implicit contract of trust between ethical and responsible journalists and the societies in which they live, embodied in the concept of the fourth estate. To succeed, journalists need direct access to primary sources. They can't survive without them, nor can society. In times of trouble, people have turned to journalists as a source of reliable and accessible information that enhances their ability to make judgments and to debate important issues. Well-founded and properly resourced journalism is able to act as a beacon for hope and for inspiration, providing reassurance to those who are trapped. I have witnessed this firsthand around the world. 
Exemplary journalism is fearless and tenacious and can be transformational, providing a catalyst for change, as the exposure of the Watergate scandal demonstrated so many years ago. The award of this year's Nobel Peace Prize sends out a powerful message about the fundamental role that journalism plays in society. But journalism is under attack today. Journalists have faced severe retribution, even persecution for their activities, and they've suffered censorship, which has served to mute their voices. But arguably, even more pernicious is the impact on journalism of the breakdown of trust between governments and their people, which has been, of course, exacerbated by the pandemic and limited access to facts. In a vacuum, people seek alternative sources of information, and they're quick to accept unverified material on social media, where claim and counterclaim wage battle. This febrile atmosphere has caused many politicians to distance themselves from the filter of conventional media outlets in favour of spin that they can shape. Thus, journalists' aspect, as access to primary sources has all too frequently become blocked, and that has been replaced by one-sided announcements. And there are other threats, sensationalism, commercial interests, cost-cutting, the appetite of the 24-hour news cycle, the cult of celebrity. That's all created a crisis in the world of authoritative journalism at a time when it's sorely needed. So while the individual journalists may be committed to the pursuit of the truth, there simply may not be the appetite or even the opportunity to hear their voices in what is an information jungle. The UN's role is very important. It promotes the value of journalism to its member states and Media and Information Literacy Week is an extremely important development. It could be used as a platform to showcase the very best of journalism and the voices that need to be heard. It also supports the Universal Declaration on Human Rights to promote free and independent media around the world. It will be an opportunity for journalists and civil society to discuss advancement on UN Sustainable Development Goal 16.10. Media and Information Literacy Week can be harnessed as an opportunity for specialist training on journalists' access to mentorship and best practices. And it's also an opportunity for governments to access objective advice from experienced journalists on how to support free and independent media. This will make for a much better world. Thank you. One of the, a couple of the things that you said were just so powerful. The truth is the most powerful way of countering disinformation. But also you said that journalism is under attack today. We can't let that happen. We need it. Uh, there's been a breakdown of trust that the pandemic exacerbated and that um, people are just searching for unverified sources of information. Politicians are exploiting that and that there's a crisis in authoritative journalism in this information jungle. Thank you for also with those final inspirational words uh, on the role uh, of this week um, and how we can uh, help to overcome it. So thank you so much. Um, now over to Ms. Tudarg Wulu. Um, the floor is yours. Good morning, Ms. Fleming. Uh, thank you, Your Excellencies, for being here. Uh, my name is Cristina Tardaguila, and I'd like to talk a little bit about my story and how uh, the fight of mis- and disinformation has been my life for the last 10 years. Uh, well, as uh, some of you might know, I am a Brazilian fact checker. Uh, and I started working against mis- and disinformation back in 2013, even when uh, the um, fancy expression fake news was not internationally known and internationally uh, uh, 
you know, a, a topic. I created Agencia Lupa, which is uh, Brazil's first uh, and most uh, known fact-checking organization right now. And I'm proud to say that uh, as a dream, it started with only four people and now it employs 23 people. As you all also know, uh, Brazil is now probably the country that faces uh, the most and uh, most dangerous um, falsehood situation, let's put it this way. So we have done a lot of work and we will be doing more next year with the presidential election. I'm, I'm uh, also in, um, very, very happy to say that in 2017, um, we noticed that we were just too little uh, fact checkers to fight so many falsehoods. And we started to build what we call a army of fact checkers. And we launched Lupa Education, which was the first uh, um, initiative to try to spread media literacy in my country, Brazil. And since then, we have trained over, over 10,000 people in, in Brazil, which is not much. Uh, I'm proud to say that we are still uh, managing to get more and more people involved in our uh, training sessions, in our courses. But we have achieved a very big uh, uh, successful story yesterday. Uh, after training the entire judiciary electoral system, we finally uh, got the judges from the Supreme Electoral Court to understand what is the danger of falsehoods and, and misinformation in the electoral system in Brazil. And yesterday, um, one of the, the Supreme Court ministers uh, announced that, you know, sending um, falsehoods through bulk WhatsApp messages in the next election, in next year's election, will be considered a crime, which is a big, big, big uh, step that we're taking in our country after uh, uh, we at Lupa managed to teach uh, the judiciary system in Brazil what uh, this information is and uh, somehow how you can fight it. Well, moving on a bit in my, in my short story, I'd like to share with you the fact that from 2019 and 2021, I was the Associate Director of the International Fact Checking Network, and I had the honor to um, bring together 99 organizations at, and right when the COVID-19 uh, craziness started. So on January 24, 2020, uh, fact checkers got together and created the Coronavirus Facts Alliance, which is an amazing database uh, that you all are welcome to uh, use. It brings together right now 15,000 fact checks that have been published by those 90 uh, fact checkers a big, about uh, COVID-19, vaccines, uh, you know, and all the falsehoods, uh, this topic um, brought together. And I'm also very proud to have launched uh, four WhatsApp chatbots to uh, make this database really, really accessible to people who speak English, Portuguese, Spanish, and and uh, and people who are in India uh, speaking the different languages in in Hindi and more than that. Uh, those are very available, and please um, uh, take a look at those because that was a lot of work, and the fact-checking community would be super proud uh, to see you using this database. And now, uh, just to wrap up my uh, short communication today, uh, I'm very, very honored to be now the Senior Director uh, of Programs in the International Center for Journalism in Washington, D.C., and on Monday, we will be launching a training um, program for 80 journalists in four African countries. We will be teaching open source uh, investigations and fact checking to journalists in Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya. And uh, this is a very interesting move. And uh, I, 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 I am eager to see um, what they are going to learn and the publications they are going to uh, make as soon as uh, the first semester of next year. That's what we are expecting to see the impact. So just to uh, finish and my and, and to thank you all, I just want to um, ask you, if I may, four very uh, straight um, things that we uh, fact checkers would love to get your support on. So the first thing is, please support fact checkers. We are we are very uh, we are a very small team, and we are dealing with a gigantic problem. Uh, you, uh, and, and I understand you know this, uh, but we are small teams, uh, underfinanced, and we are being heavily attacked. So please support fact checkers and protect fact checkers. 
So in the, the third and the fourth thing I'd like to bring today is please help amplify fact checks. We are always and never losing for falsehoods. So anytime you see a fact check, retweet it, repost it, share it, go to your WhatsApp and make sure that people are reading it. It's really, really necessary to count on you to make uh, uh, fact checks reach a larger audience. And, and um, the last thing I'd like to say is help fact checkers teach what they know. Uh, they can no longer be uh, alone in the battlefield. And we need, as I, so, as I said before, uh, to create a army of fact checkers, at least in the next generation. So we really look forward to make sure that um, those who are teenagers today don't have to battle mis and disinformation as we're doing now. Thank you very much. And uh, see you later. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Christina. I mean, you really gave us some concrete examples on the role of, of fact checking and how inspiring that you've created this army in Brazil and that you're bringing this knowledge uh, to the rest of the world. I think it is great to have a, a statement with, with calls to action um, for all of us. And so count on us uh, also in my department and on the Verified Initiative, let's be in touch. Um, and congratulations on getting um, bulk WhatsApp messages to be considered a crime. Um, that will go a long way to ensuring um, probably a, a, a more um, stable election and more truthful. Um, so great to hear from you. And I will now turn to Ms. Mina Dennert, who is a journalist and founder of the I Am Here International um, uh, movement. So over to you, Ms. Dennert. Thank you so much for inviting me to this important conversations, excellencies, colleagues, friends. Uh, my name is Mina Dennett, and I'm a Swedish journalist, writer, and the founder and secretary general of I Am Here International. So the more clearly we take a stand for what we believe in, uh, the greater the risk is that we become pawns in someone else's political games and supporting very uncontroversial issues such as protecting the environment, diversity, and inclusion, or standing up for human rights uh, lead to pylons, hateful attacks, and death threats. Uh, research showing uh, that alarming numbers of bystanders are watching the attacks of others online, and as a result, start self-censoring themselves and dare not openly take a stand on, and journalists dare not cover certain issues. So with these struggles in mind, six years ago, before Brexit, before the 2016 US election, before I had even heard of fake news or algorithms, I saw the consequences online. How writers, journalists, politicians, especially women and visible minorities were attacked. So I became interested in what was going on um, from witnessing how my contacts on social media became radicalized and started spreading misinformation, many times unaware that they were uh, what they were spreading wasn't true. So to me as a journalist, it was obvious, and I realized I needed to share my knowledge of how journalism, media, and information could work to benefit vulnerable readers online. So I developed a method to lessen the fear of commitment for others like me, to inspire people online to engage in hateful comment sections, to stop the disinformation and the politically motivated hate, and to do it in a constructive and non confrontational way to help stop polarization. So I founded the I Am Here Network in Sweden. And one year later, we founded the uh, German, Slovak, Finnish chapters. And now we're active in about 18 countries worldwide. And the network is about 150,000 members strong. So in, in the I Am Here Network, uh, we support the targeted in hateful comment sections together with our members and by providing workshops on how to protect yourselves online to, for example, editors, journalists, members of parliament. We stop the politically motivated hate in the comment sections again uh, together with our members so anyone in the network can uh, initiate this kind of support. And uh, by giving workshops to, for example, universities, NGOs and other member organizations to encourage more people to speak up and react when they encounter online hate. And we educate people about fact-checking and inspiring people to prevent the spread of misinformation by sharing sources of factual information. And we do it by uh, 
workshops on moderation that we offer to, for example, television broadcasters, media outlets, unions, mun municipalities. And we give advice on how to prevent these threatening and hateful situations from happening in the first place, suggesting things that you can do proactively. We provide strategies uh, which will help others to handle the situations once it's happened and know what to do in the heat of the moment, but also how to mobilize your allies. So anyone who stand up for and share the same visions as you and how to bring strong, uh, build strong and active communities online. So I want to end uh, with Brandolini's law that describes how it takes so much more energy, time and money to respond to the false claims than it does to make them up. So uh, we need all these uh, amazing uh, efforts that we're hearing about today to keep fighting disinformation. And we must not forget to tell our own stories, share our own messages, focusing on our allies and activating our networks. Continue to support and share what we believe in. Thank you so much uh, for listening. And please don't hesitate to contact me or the network if there's anything that we can do to help you or your organization. Thank, thank you so much. That was incredibly um, inspiring to learn about your initiative. Um, yeah, I, I think we are all aware of the, as you said, alarming numbers um, of attacks on people who are trying to do, to to brought you know to tell the truth. Um, and uh, the, the interesting point that you said there's so many bystanders who are standing by, and now you're engaging them and giving them um, the power to uh, call out online hate and, and, and try to prevent polarization. Fabulous initiative. It's great to see that it's also spreading internationally. We love that uh, as well at the UN. So thank you so much, uh, Ms. Milan. So um, we now turn to uh, Ms. Mia Milan, uh, founding editor-in-chief of Becca's CISA, the Center for Health Journalism. Over to you. I think you're on mute, uh, but oh. apologies for that. Thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you so much for inviting me today. I work for a small media organization in South Africa. As you've mentioned, it's called Beke Sisa, Center for Health Journalism. And Beke Sisa is an Isi Zulu word in South Africa. That's our largest language that means to scrutinize. So we try to scrutinize health issues. And I want to speak a little bit about from the perspective of someone who has been a, a health journalist through two epidemics in my country. Now, the news media obviously has the power to make or break communication during public health crises. And as a South African journalist, I've seen this firsthand with two of the epidemics in my country, and that's HIV and covid now, in the early 2000s in South Africa, that was a period when there was widespread HIV denialism in South Africa. And journalists then really played a crucial role in countering that misinformation, such as false facts that HIV didn't cause AIDS or that HIV treatment was toxic and didn't work. And those were um, arguments that were high profile arguments and high profile people, political leaders, very high up in government um, supported those um, arg arguments based on misinformation. So during this time, journalists helped, but we had to rely very heavily on the help of civil society and of scientists to help us break down science we didn't always understand and also help us to present it in a way that our audiences could make sense of it. But that was a time that really showed me just how powerful partnerships can be. The partnership between HIV activists and the news media and scientists put enough pressure on the South African government to change its policy, to not provide HIV treatment in the public sector, to one where the country could access, anyone in the country could access antiretroviral treatment for free. And that policy has been the difference between life and death for millions of people in South Africa. And today, the life expectancy in my country has increased by more than 10 years because of that decision. And 
those partnerships between civil society, scientists, and journalists are therefore really, really crucial and can make the difference between life and death. But again, we're at a crossroads now where there's another pandemic that affects the entire world, COVID, of course, and where mis and disinformation, as you've mentioned, is really rife, particularly when it comes to COVID vaccines. And the thing about spreading the wrong facts during pandemics is that the wrong information during a pandemic could literally lead to life or death, because so much of what we report on in the media during such health, health crises um, determines whether people take up life-saving interventions or not. But this COVID pandemic too has taught me that partnerships are the most powerful way to bring information to people. So at my center, Becca Sisa, we are fortunate because we can employ journalists who can exclusively focus on, on health issues and journalists who are familiar with research methodology and also scientific concepts. So when COVID hit South Africa, we partnered with a national television station that didn't have science reporters, and we filled a daily slot where our reporters could then break down complex concepts for the TV viewers, and they gave us a platform to have our information go further, but we help them in turn to break down the science. And we also formed a partnership with a data journalism organization here in South Africa to help us to report in more creative ways. Um, they helped us to produce maps with information that would otherwise be very difficult to understand. And that helped our audience to make sense of the information. And in turn, we could help them to access contacts that could give the information that they would otherwise not have in our health department because we've managed to build that up over a few years. To end, I've learned two things, um, many things, but here are two things that I've learned during pandemics. The one is that people really just don't want mere accurate facts. Just having accurate information out there doesn't really help that much. It helps when you make that information meaningful to people. So we as journalists, if we want to counter misinformation, we need to make sure that the information we're reporting on, that we understand it well enough to break it down in a way that helps people to understand why it's relevant to their lives and how to apply it to their lives. And that is why less is more. Rather take the time to present the facts in a way that people can understand them and take the time to understand them yourselves and interpret it for people than trying to produce many, many stories. Then lastly, that leads me to the tools that we use to distribute information. So I've learned during COVID specifically that the time when a journalist could argue that the only task that they have is to produce a story and only the contents of that story, that time is over. And um, we now live in a time where just writing a story and publishing it in the, on the website is no longer necessarily the only way to distribute that information or even the most powerful way to distribute that information. So one of those ways is social media and that's channels like Twitter, for instance, and that's exactly the channels that anti-vaxxers use to distribute information. So that's why we as journalists should use them too. But that means our skill set need to change a little bit because to do Twitter threats and to use social media effectively, you need skills that are a little bit different from just the skills that you need to write a story. And that means that if we want to play a a, a crucial role in distributing accurate information. We need to adjust and expand our skills a little bit. And we also need to adjust our job descriptions a little bit because it goes beyond just writing the story. It's time consuming to answer people and to interact with people on, on social media, but it's incredibly powerful because it makes your story with the correct facts go further and it makes accurate and meaningful information go further. And it just means adjust for the times. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mia Milan. That uh, is also exactly how our approach at Verified is trying to uh, reach people because we found that the usual news story or press release was not, was not engaging people. So partnerships, civil society, governments, journalists, as you said, absolutely crucial and I love what you said about how you have to, you can't just put out facts and expect people to 
want to listen to them, you have to make them meaningful, uh, you have to make them relevant, and uh, you have to give them uh, a chance to know how to apply them. So it's a big challenge. New skills for journalists, new skills also for communicators in public health, communicators at the UN. So a great message for teaming together. Thank you so much for that intervention. Um, I think we have time for one question in this round from our audience, and this is a question to Christina. Um, could you elaborate on the initiatives related to dis and misinformation on private messaging apps, which are so difficult to address precisely because of their private nature? Sure, thank you so much. And yes, uh, let me go back a bit and explain um, what we're doing. Uh, in, in 2018, uh, well, actually, the, yesterday, the Supreme Electoral Court decided that it is clear that in 2018, the campaign run by President Bolsonaro uh, used uh, both WhatsApp messages to spread falsehoods. This happened, but this this uh, we only found out about it, this because there was this great journalist, Patricia Campos Melo in Folha de São Paulo, uh, who managed to reveal the existence of a group of businessmen who decided to get together and actually pay communications companies to send uh, bulk messages on WhatsApp. So we did not have any um, uh breach on, on, on security and encryption. It was just good journalism that brought together that information. So yesterday, again, after um, telling the universe that it, this actually happened and, um, and calling it really bad, this, the, electoral, the Supreme Electoral Court decided that from now on, this is going to be considered a um, abuse of economic power, which is a crime, an electoral, electoral crime in Brazil. And of course, um, we as Brazilians, we are now uh, thinking about how can we track possible uh, about messages sent on encrypted platforms without breaking encryption and without uh, uh, running over the freedom of expression. Again, this has just happened yesterday and the conversation is very, very fast today. And we are eager to bring what's up to the conversation as, as soon as possible. Uh, but we do uh, have to say that uh, Brazil is in a very difficult moment related to freedom of expression. And there are very, very um, bad written um, bills on the Congress, and, and that is something that worries fact checkers a lot. So we, for in one hand, we celebrate the decision that was taken by, by the Superior Electoral Court yesterday, but on the other hand, we are a bit worried about how this is gonna be tracked. And uh, we'll let you uh, know as soon as we have more information about it. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Christina. I, our next question, it comes from Latvia. and. Andres, if this is you, if it's from you, if you could, uh, I'll, I'll try to say it, but maybe we need a little more clarification. Um, the question is, what are the speaker's views on the impact of our communications with our target audiences? Do we reach our intended audiences and can we see attitudinal or even behavioral changes? Is this, is this about UN communications or just a general, a general question? And Andres, uh, the PR of Latvia, is this your question? Do you want to elaborate or uh, can I? Dear Miss Fleming, it's the deputy oh. PR, Ivar speaking. Uh, Hi, it Ivar. was my question. And oh. uh, it was more of a general nature to the speakers about their intended audiences, whether they see uh, that they uh, uh, can reach them and in what way and what is the change in maybe attitude and behavior. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that. I think, um, I think that uh, I, I can just say at the UN, we're very, uh, very, we've moved really to targeting audiences and not just to broadcasting generally to the public, but to really looking at um, who are we trying to reach. And in the case, in the situation with COVID, it's really those take vaccines who are hesitant, who are wavery and and the goal is to create um, behavioral change um, and to measure that impact. So I think with, does anyone want to take that on from the panelists? I mean, some of you are not, your goal is, is to check facts or, um, but to reach people directly with behavioral change, I think maybe Mia from, from South Africa could maybe best address that question. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you, Melissa. So um, the interesting thing for me during this time of COVID with reaching people with your message is that many people's target audiences broadened a bit because the information became so crucial for everyone. So at Bikisisa, for instance, where we normally target a decision-making audience, our audience broadened to normal people who just want to make know about science because COVID affects their lives. So um, I think a general um, sort of strategy, not just for a place like us, but also for formal organizations was to change the way in which they, or to broaden the way in which they bring the messages. And in our case, that meant that we had to have more formats in which we presented stories. We could no longer just have a print format for a story. So we started to produce many more videos, short videos, to you know, of the same print story, just like a shorter version of it. And we started with Twitter threads. We started with stories that we only put on social media. It's not even on the website because that is how people started to consume information during COVID. The interesting thing that I started to see from formal organizations is that they almost started to bridge that line of just being uh, making announcements to spreading information or becoming journalists in the sense that scientists, you know, scientists who never spoke to their audience or to the people that consume the information started to do threats still do threats on Twitter. When they have a study that they now publish, they, they publish a threat on Twitter that people interact with. And the direct result of that is not just communication with them directly, but that they get far further with that message that more media organizations do stories about that study because it's explained now in a way that a normal person can basically understand it. And it would be very interesting for me to see, I haven't followed it that closely, but to see if governments are going to start to do that or UN agencies, because it's a real way to get a message across there in a sort of like a format and a package that people, that it appeals more to people and that the media then reacts far more robustly to it than when it's just a press release or just a little video clip. Right. Well, I think we're all agreeing that the, the age of the press release standing alone is, is over. We need to find ways to engage uh, digitally and to, to um, also use these formats ourselves. So thank you very much for that. And, and we do have actually time for one more question. It's about partnerships and building partnerships. And, and I, many of you um, have started in your own countries and have gone international. But the question is um, that many, there are many countries don't have large civil society ecosystems. So does it make sense to build is it easier to build partnerships in English than in other language, other languages internationally? Um, I am sure that Christina has something to say about that. Um, yeah. yeah, Melissa, the, the topic related to language is also something that um, catch my attention. Uh, as a Portuguese speaker, um, I have to say that uh, we really need uh, to get everyone thinking, uh, not only in English, um, and, and when I say that, um, I'm thinking about tech companies, I'm thinking about uh, communications efforts, I'm thinking about solutions, um, you know, and even, even um, easy tools like speech to text, they're very not uh, working in many, many, many languages. So this is the collaborations in terms to develop technology that is good enough to help fact checkers reduce the time between the moment they find a, a lie and the moment they write a fact check. That is where we need to work right now in a collaborative way to make sure this, this time lapse is smaller and smaller and smaller. And um, this is not gonna be probably not a human effort only, but truly a, a technology uh, issue. Uh, and again, um, besides and beyond English. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think one last question to Kashini. I wonder if you're seeing, because um, you're covering uh, global issues and you know now we have COP26. Um, we've been really focusing on COVID um, here. Do you see any parallels uh, between uh, reporting, trying to get the truth out um, here on it, it, in climate action, public health emergencies and um, and and maybe other other kinds of issues. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, 
I think we've got an absolutely fascinating picture with global communications at the moment. Uh, we had all the tunnel vision of the COVID pandemic where all media seem to be preoccupied with the next stage of pandemic management. So be it facts about the pandemic, deaths, transmissions, cases, management, COVID really has dominated for the last 18 months or so. We're now in a, a phase of transition. Um, obviously, the COP26 summit is uppermost on the minds of many governments around the world who are traveling to the UK for those very important discussions. Um, I think the most important thing is going to be to take the discussions out of the realm of simply talking into what translates into concrete action. And in terms of that, um, there is a really big job to be done because uh, with social media, which is wonderful for transmission of verified information, um, it's not so great for those of us who are in the business of transmission of facts. Um, to use social media to really focus on that verified information and proper action that can be taken because um, there is a, a danger that all these information channels get subverted by those who are seeking to perpetuate misinformation. That in turn undermines the efforts of governments and civil organizations. So well said. Thank you, Shimi. I, I see Mina there, and I'm just going to come to you really briefly, because what is, in your view, the fundamental problem? I mean, you were talking about uh, the hate being um, perpetuated by you know, bystanders who, who are maybe anonymous and who are putting in comments and who are a device. What, how can we solve this problem? Your, your solution is engaging, but there, is there anything that the, more that the platforms can do? Yes, and uh, um, the regulations that we have had in, in other uh, press or, uh, for, for ages, uh, I mean, um, we really need to think about how both to uh, legislate better and to get the hate, off, hate speech, off, speech off, but also um, getting resources to actually follow up because uh, even when people are... Uh, uh, um, reporting to the police, for example, to uh, of uh, reporting hate speech, uh, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't um, lead to actual um, consequences. So I think uh, th there's a lot of resources that needs to be done, of course, from from civil society, from from uh, the media out outlets, the platforms, uh, and also from legislation. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Mina. It's really a, a catch up game. And now soon we're going to have to be studying the metaverse. But uh, let's let's turn to our next segment, which is case studies of cooperation between government and civil society organizations. Thanks to our speakers in the previous panel. That was fantastic. Um, our next four speakers here are Camilla Grenier, Operations Manager on, for the Forum on Information and Democracy, Representative. Nashi Longo Gavarshus, Founder of the Internet Societies, Namib Namibia, the Internet Societies Namibia Chapter. Solvita Denisa, Lipnis, who is a disinformation resilience advisor of the Baltic Center for Media Excellence. It's interesting, we have these titles now, disinformation resilience advisor, great. Uh, Lisa, finally, Lisa Ginsburg, acting secretary general of the European Digital Media Observatory. So first I give the floor to Ms. Mr. Grenier. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Under Secretary uh, Fleming, and thank you uh, everyone for the uh, kind invitation. Uh, and I'm really pleased uh, to be with you today to tell you a bit uh, more about this initiative 
on information democracy uh, that was launched three years ago. And that is a good example of cooperation between civil society and uh, and the international community and, and uh, states and governments around the world. The International Initiative on Information and Democracy was uh, initially launched by a Press Freedom NGO Reporters Without Borders, which figured that um, the rules uh, and the structure of the information and communication space uh, and its evolution throughout the last decade was in disfavor of trustworthy news and information uh, and journalism uh, globally. So the first step uh, we took to um, implement some democratic safeguards in the information and communication space was to define a set of principles. Uh, we did that in 2018 with a high level commission uh, where we were already uh, really pleased to have uh, the recent Nobel uh, laureate Mario Ressa uh, and, and others experts from civil society and uh, from uh, different fields. Um, together they drafted the Declaration on Information Democracy, which was then taken over by a first core group of 12 heads of states and government from different regions on the occasion of the Paris Peace Forum that was in November 2018. And this process led to the signature of the International Partnership on Information Democracy, an intergovernmental uh, agreement on a set of principles designed by civil society and then taken to the international stage. The states of uh, the information and, and, and democracy partnership held their, their first summit exactly uh, one month ago on the 24th, uh, on, the, um, on the, the uh, margins of the UN General Assembly. And we, uh, and these states discussed uh, some recommendations made by the implementing entity of this partnership which is led by civil society, the Forum on Information and Democracy. The Forum on Information and Democracy was created by, uh, by 11, 11 organizations, including reporters to our borders. Um, and we uh, develop these high level principles to produce and provide the raw materials for regulation and self-regulation in this space to implement these democratic guarantees. We've come up and we were talking about infodemics, of course. Uh, we published our first report one year ago already on how to end infodemics that was co-chaired by Maria Ressa and, um, and Marietta Schake. Uh, and we've provided to the 43 uh, countries of the partnership uh, with 250 very concrete solutions for more transparency of platform to increase the reliability of information online for content moderation and also for private messaging systems. We're talking about it as we've seen a lot of disinformation uh, going through these services. We have called in another report published earlier this year for a new deal for journalism because as uh, it was already mentioned, uh, journalism is, is under threat and uh, the sustainability of journalism is really under threat. And if we want to increase media literacy, and the ability to address our shared ability to address the most pressing issues of our time, we need to have this trusted third party uh, that is journalism uh, and its social, social function. I don't want to take too long, but maybe one uh, quick last word. We are starting to build an equivalent of the IPCC for the information and communication space. It's uh, the International Observatory on Information Democracy and we're really proud to uh, be working with Shoshana Zuboff from uh, Harvard University and former Secretary General of the OECD, Henri Gouria, who will help us build this uh, new institution. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Grenier, for that really interesting information on the forum uh, on information and democracy. I think we learned a lot. Another example of partnerships, 11 organizations. Um, and Looking forward to seeing these high-level principles. And um, absolutely, I think we would all agree um, that we need a new deal for journalism. So thank you for that uh, description and, and, and call. We all know that the sustainability of journalism is under threat, as you said in your words. 
So now over to uh, Nashilongu Javarshus, who is the founder of the Internet Society Namibia chapter. Thank you. Thank you, um, Your Excellencies, um, in having me here today. Um, as Ms. Fleming had mentioned, my name is Nashilongu Gervashes. And um, amongst others, I've worked as a journalist and a media lecturer. Um, and I find myself these days working in the intersection of technology policy and societies. Um, and it's from, where, it's from there that I have found the Internet um, Society, the Namibia chapter. Um, but also serving as an advisor for the Namibia Internet Governance Forum um, working group while working um, with a number of networks on the African region um, generally. So in illustrating the importance of civil society organizations in tackling dis and misinformation online, as well as strengthening resilience of societies both nationally um, and globally, let me start by highlighting the contested role of social media from a technology policy space, where the question of whether social media in particular is a tool for peace or conflict constantly arise. From our work as a civil society organization, working at the intersection of society and technology, we recognize that information is powerful and accurate information more so, empowers society and strengthens democratic processes altogether. Increasingly, the work around minimizing the danger of misinformation, disinformation and malinformation altogether have become very challenging, especially during the pandemic. What we, had, what we know, however, is that the spread of misinformation is a very conflated issue that is shaped by loads of factors. Relationship being one of them, as we know, relationships are backbones of societies. And the other is the platforms and channels where misinformation is spreading on. But most importantly, literacy levels, especially information literacy, have pointed out to be a very key challenges over the years. And it's based on that, that information literacy have become an operational area for most of civil societies in Namibia um, and the region in general. And there's a direct bearing fruits from these exercises. Particular case in point here is the fact-checking exercises and rebutting of hate speech and gendered violence online which we have been working on. Um, and this have resulted in victims being empowered to effectively communicate um, their truthful positions by using the same channels used for mis misinformation, but also exploring alternative channels. Particularly regarding infodemic trends in the region, we have picked up that disinformation when picked up gets verified and, and a verified version then get distributed via various channels, including social media networks, but also including partnerships with the media. These exercises, as you know, are very time consuming. They are very expensive, but also needs budgetary uh, allocations, particularly for us in the civil society. And, and on the other hand, um, these have also built a business case for the future and sustainability of the media, of the media in particular, that it also looks very blink with the spread of technology. So with government support, and, but also with funding from development partners such as UNESCO um, in the country, we're continuously working together cohesively in dealing with misinformation, raising awareness on hate speech and during the pandemic, but also in general, uh, as well we support media and sustaining that. The trends in general of reports have been that the super spreaders are generally communities in, in rural areas, um, in particular, the older age categories. And this is because of connectivity issues, making information very limited, but also this is where the digital skills generally are, are lacking. As Fleming as I and, and um, our whole panel and everyone else um, today, as I wrap up, our work to empower communities with verified and authentic information um, continues to be very um, important. Um, as we share and spread and counter incorrect information and that doing so by promoting reliable and access accessible content. Thank you, Chair, and uh, let me submit here. Thank, thank you so much, Ms. Javashus. That was uh, fascinating to hear a case study uh, of Namibia. Um, <laughs> It's, is there a country in the world where ha hate speech, uh, misinformation, disinformation is not a, 
alive and kicking. Um, so it's interesting what you said uh, that it is the super spreaders are, are, are the local communities and it's the older people that need to be targeted uh, with media literacy more than anything. Um, but also you're uh, again echoing the importance of partnerships. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that your government is supporting as well as uh, UNESCO. Um, so yes, again, that emphasis on, on partnership. So thanks very much for that example. I'd like now to bring in Dr. Denisa uh, uh, Lipnis, who is the Disinformation Resilience Advisor of the Baltic Center for Media Excellence. Excellencies, congratulations uh, on this event. It is uh, very timely and uh, thank you for promoting media and information literacy and qualitative journalism. Thank you for inviting the Baltic Center for Media Excellence to share our lessons learned. We are a hub for smart journalism. We provide trainings for the journalists. Uh, we also inform the journalists about the trending issues and information security, integrity of elections, helping newsrooms to get better in their everyday activities. And the everyday activities of journalists are protecting democracy. Additionally, we implement media literacy activities in the Baltic countries for different types of audiences, for kids, including those belonging to ethnic minorities, as contests, as schools for young journalists, for teachers, for seniors also engaging with journalists and working in different languages and regions. And we also conduct research. We think that it is important to work on evidence-based activities. We gather experience from different sectors, including academia, media monitoring, and of course, government-related actors. And for example, currently we are finalizing a research project on media literacy actors and activities in Latvia and also in Eastern Partnership countries, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. And we can share some preliminary uh, relevant findings. We believe that a national policy strategy and holistic approach is necessary for media literacy to be successful. Media literacy is not only an education and culture related issue, it is a matter of security. Uh, firstly, the media environment is changing, media consumption is changing, and we have to update existing programs and materials. We have to update it with a human-centric approach. And by saying human-centric approach, uh, we are talking not only about facts, but also about emotions and making it a basis. One of the most important issues is defining vulnerable audiences, segmenting and finding the right way to address the selected audience. Secondly, cross-sectoral cooperation and networking is essential, and it leads to sustainability also for us and Jews, and we need to meet formally and informally to share the best practice. Thirdly, media literacy should be desired, not imposed. The holistic approach in promoting media literacy is needed, especially in divided societies. It is also linked to trust, and uh, I would add that we should increase awareness among politicians that going against qualitative journalism is going against democracy. Any media literacy activity should be based on evidence and should be evaluated. Moreover, poorly collected data could mislead the stakeholders and the society to blame some groups, to create new borders and gaps, new fears, new threats, and we do not run that. And uh, possibly it sounds like an ABC for the future media literacy activities, and it is A, audience adaptability, B, basics to be updated, C, cooperation, D, demand and desire, and E, evaluation and evidence. And I do not have time to add F, but I think that the example of UN communicating with the dinosaurus, Fred, entering the EU headquarters in New York is an excellent example of combining fear and fun. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. Yes, and I encourage everyone to watch um, that fabulous uh, UNDP uh, small a short film where a dinosaur um, enters the UN General Assembly and warns about uh, in extinction from someone who knows. So yeah, that's surprising, um, getting people to, to be worried, but also to have fun. That's a great, <laughs> a great example. Yes, thank you so much also for, for your insights into, um, especially what, you're, what you said about journalists protecting democracy and 
that um, this should be a nat media lit literacy should be a national policy strategy and that it is a matter of security. But also we need a human centric approach because people don't want this imposed on them. Again, this theme of it doesn't work just to spew facts. We need emotive content. Um, OK, I think we all grasp your A, B, C, D, E, audience basics, cooperation, demand and desire, evaluation and evidence. We'll try to absorb that. That sounds like a fantastic formula. Um, but again, yes, and I just wanted to repeat what you said, that going against journalism is going against democracy, a word to politicians who are attacking journalism. Thank you so much for that insightful intervention. Um, now let's hear from Ms. Uh, Ginsburg. Lisa uh, Ginsburg is the acting secretary general of the European Digital Media Observatory. Over to you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It's an honor to be here today. Um, I'm here to present the case study of the European Digital Media Observatory, in short, EDMO. So EDMO was established in June 2020 as an independent observatory, bringing together stakeholders working to tackle online disinformation, including fact checkers, academic researchers, social media platforms, and media literacy practitioners. It aims to contribute to a deeper understanding of disinformation relevant actors, vectors, tools, methods, dissemination dynamics, and impact on society. In short, EDMO offers a body of facts, evidence, and tools that gathers stakeholders and acts in the interest of society. EDMO is funded by the EU, but is independent from any national or EU public authority. It is based on a consortium and the governance of EDMO is entrusted to an executive and, a, and an advisory board. So at the heart of the ethos of EDMO is the idea that in order to adequately tackle online disinformation, we need to first better understand it. So it therefore focuses on strengthening societal resilience as a future-proof way to counter disinformation, including through fact-checking, media and information literacy, and academic research aimed at fostering balanced, multidimensional, and sustainable approaches, while safeguarding freedom of expression and the diversity and sustainability of the European news media ecosystem. Um, so EDMO carries out this vision through a number of activities. Um, first, it has set up a digital collaborative platform that brings together fact checkers in a common environment, allowing them to collaborate and to access a set of tools and resources to facilitate the detection and analysis of misinformation incidents. To date, 20 fact checking organizations from across Europe have joined EDMO's fact checking network and have started to produce the first collaborative investigations. The EDMO collaborative platform for researchers will soon also be launched to facilitate collaborative academic analysis of disinformation campaigns. And EDMO supports the coordination of academic research activities on disinformation in Europe, including through a number of repositories of scientific literature and policy papers. EDMO is also currently developing its media literacy work in order to provide expertise and opportunities for connection that will empower media literacy practitioners in Europe in the fight against disinformation. EDMO also aims to provide academic input and methodological support to public authorities in the monitoring of the policies put in place by online platforms to limit the spread and the impact of online disinformation. So in this context, EDMO has been providing background research in support of the monitoring of the code of practice on online disinformation. And the recent guidance by the European Commission on the revision of the Code of Practice on Online Disinformation includes a number of roles for EDMO, including in relation to media literacy, in analyzing information, information and data reported by the signatories of the Code of Practice, and in assessing the impact of the code at the national and at the EU level, and in also in participating in a permanent task force aimed at evolving and adapting the code in the future. So EDMO is currently developing recommendations on improving the monitoring of the code of practice on online disinformation through key performance, including through key performance indicators. 
Finally, um, eight Edmo national or multinational hubs were um, selected in May and have started their activities this month. They cover Ireland, Belgium, Czech Republic, Denmark, Finland, France, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Poland, Slovakia, Spain, Sweden, as well as Norway. And through the national hubs, Edmo aims to increase its capacity of tackling harmful disinformation campaigns at the national level national and EU level and analyze their impact on society and democracy. So the idea is that each hub will contribute to the creation of a multidisciplinary community by pulling together academic researchers, fact checkers, media practitioners and other relevant stakeholders at the national level in order to create a network which is capable of detecting and analyzing disinformation campaigns as well as producing content to support mainstream and local media and public authorities in exposing harmful disinformation campaigns. They also aim to organize media literacy activities and finally they will provide support to national authorities for the monitoring of online platforms, policies, and the digital media ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Ginsburg, for this fascinating um, outline of what Edmo does. Um, I think I, I learned a lot and, and certainly would love to learn more. I think we could all benefit from this network, especially the focus on um, on analysis and uh, and uh, metrics um, and support of of um, countries in their campaigns, and then pulling back and being able to to analyze um, how well it did. Uh, the multidisciplinary community that you're fostering um, sounds sounds really important, so that we can all learn what works and what doesn't. So thank you very much for this. Um, we now have time to go to some questions from our audience. Uh, we have a question from our colleague from India. Uh, he would, or she, I think, would. I'm not sure, it just says India colleague, would be happy if panelists could highlight some innovative technological solutions adopted by CSOs to address the misinformation and disinformation challenges. Um, so, innovative technological solutions. So I think this this goes beyond the content. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say from the perspective of our verified initiative, um, the technology is definitely so key, the distribution channels. I think some, one of the colleagues said it's so important to compete where misinformation and disinformation actors are. Um, but the content in our point of view is, is, is also really key because if we if we put out a PDF document on, on our social media channels and the nugget of important information is on page 156, um, that's not going to work. So creating very you know, engaging information that's, that's um, a, a content that, that is, works and travels well on, on social media channels sparks the, the, the kind of um, inspiration to share as peer-to-peer -peer information is shared, is that is key for us. But I wonder, you know, logical, specific solutions to tackling misinformation and disinformation. Maybe our, from Namibia, would you like, and then Mr. Grenier, after you, Mr. Ms. Gavash. Yes, yes. Thank you, Ms. Fleming. Um, I could speak, maybe not in the Namibian context, but the Africa context, where uh, we have some of the biggest um, fact-checking platforms where, for instance, Africa Check being one of those um, platforms. As, um, and, and through our work, we are empowering the communities to use this kind of platforms, especially when they have access to a media file or a media link to use, um, you know, Africa Check link and put it there and verify um, the authenticity of this of, of, of this um, file media file where it come from how long it it, it has been circulating um, just just one of those in innovations um, I think I think at, at, at this point this is that's as far as, as where we have been we are also constantly um, informing and educating the public about especially on social media on reporting information that doesn't look genuine or that is very malicious. 
um, and, and 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 really at this point that is where we we where where we are operating. Once again, we are only um, targeting um, communities that has connectivity, and with that, we hope that they are able to relate information with, especially with families um, that are, are are not connected and don't don't have access as uh, as previously indicated. Thank you. Uh, that is yeah, so important to point out. We can't just assume that everybody is receiving their information um, through digital channels. Uh, so I wonder, Camille Grenier, would you like to come in here? Yes, very quickly. Uh, so it's not a digital tool, a digital tool per se, but uh, eventually uh, we hope that it will really help promote reliable and trustworthy news sources online. Uh, and it's an initiative. Uh, also launched by reporters with our borrowers three years ago on actually how do we deal with the fact that today all contents are at the same level and uh, you know if we talk about content moderation then you have risk for uh, freedom of expression and opinion and really how do we elevate the reach of uh, reliable uh, information and reliable sources online. What RSF has done is uh, actually inspired by absolutely, or maybe all the other industrial sectors where you have um, standards for you know, your providers, for example, uh, use this certification mechanism for uh, media outlets that comply with the ethical and professional norms of journalism uh, to then have some data points that platforms uh, and other aggregators can uh, use to really uh, promote these uh, new sources. So very briefly, we've uh, gathered 120 organizations, including uh, the UNESCO, um, uh, and uh, together they drafted uh, the standard, the Journalism Trust Initiative, uh, the JTI standard. Uh, and now we are in the implementing uh, phase. So we have uh, starting to um, have some media run the uh, self-evaluation, then they will go through the certification process. And uh, with this, we hope that, uh, you know, we will have some very concrete um, uh, results in increasing the, the trustworthiness of news online. Thank you very, very much for that. That's really interesting. Um, we, we have a, uh, the PR from Georgia, um, Ambassador Kaha Imnatse, would like to take the floor himself and ask a question. Uh, well, thank you, Melissa. Actually, I, I do not have a question. I've been uh, delighted to uh, co-sponsor this event as one of the pen holders of, of the resolution that we passed last year. And uh, um, the discussions have been absolutely, absolutely wonderful. One thing that really, for me, hit the target was what Mia and Kishini were talking about. Uh, Mia mentioned about the accurate and meaningful information, and that's quite often less is more. And this is absolutely fundamental, and it goes to what Kishini said about trust, because what we are observing today is the lack of trust, and that does erode the whole fabric of society, because media is, is today not only a tool, but it's also an agent, and it's also a victim, because everything goes uh, through, uh, through media, and today we even observe how prof uh, the borders between professions are being blurred. Everybody's a journalist, everybody's a politician, everybody's an expert, everybody's a scientist. So we do need media literacy. And we, in general, we do need literacy. But we live in the society of the information. You see, um, it is no longer about the facts. It's rather more about the perceptions on, on the fact. So because of that, it is even more pertinent to have media uh, literacy week. Uh, I think it was Jefferson who said 200 years ago that men who reads nothing is better educated than the men who reads nothing but newspapers. So it was true then, and it is true now, because we are so much in the jungle of uh, information and to discern the right information there, it is very important. So media literacy is, uh, is absolutely essential. And I think we need to do follow up of, uh, of these events. Uh, and from my delegation and the like minded, I think we'll be eager to continue this work so that we can 
we can have society literate, media literate, and all of us uh, literate in, uh, in this regard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kaha. Uh, I wonder if Jefferson today, uh, maybe he was referring to tabloids, hopefully, back then. <laughs> I wonder what, he would, what comment he would have today. Um, but yes, thanks for that. It is no longer about facts, but perception. And thanks so much for your support uh, for our media literacy initiatives and, and for this event. It's really critical. Um, I'd like to, to the, the Japanese um, uh, permanent representative was not able to deliver this himself. He had to leave, but left us with a, with a statement, um, a comment. So I'd like to read it out. Um, misinformation of the inf infodemic is an existential threat to humanity, not just in the health field, but also in social national security areas as well. Above all, it endangers human security. We need media literacy as much as vaccines are needed to fight against the pandemic. That's a great statement. Our endeavors require holistic, continuous, and consistent approach. Inclusive efforts carried out by various players, civil society, private sector, et cetera, with the UN at its center are critically important. I see all of you nodding, so I think we all agree with that. And let's just see if we have um, time for, there was another question that came in, which was given that most people consume information without always being able to discern how factual it is and what agenda it might be serving, what opportunities exist for strengthening multi-stakeholder approaches for cooperation to combat this. I think in all of your interventions, you were, you all work for multi-stakeholder approaches, um, but I wonder if anyone would like to come in and and add to that question. How about yes? Go ahead, Nashilongo. Thank you. Um, yes, you are right, uh, Ms. Fleming, by indicating that literally almost everybody is working through a multi-stakeholder approach, and that also reflected, I think, with my colleague from Brazil. What we are doing with Namibia um, and the Internet Society is the Secretariat of the Namibia Internet Governance Forum is that annually we bring uh, multi-stakeholder uh, players in the room from your telcos to government, your regulators, to development partners. And we interrogate um, emerging issues um, within the country from a national agenda. Um, as you know, from the UN system, the Internet governance um, is not a binding, uh, a, a policy binding making mechanism, but um, it helps with um, coming up with regulations or amendments at local level immediately and addressing issues such as misinformation. Um, for instance, that's the kind of approaches that uh, many countries have taken, especially in implementing the misinformation laws. Um, that were implemented um, by, by, by many governments um, during the pandemic. So the multi-stakeholder platform for us especially continues to work. Uh, for us, it was a cabinet, and I think it's in a number of African countries, was, it was a, a cabinet making um, as, a, as meeting the, 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 the signatories at um, the UN level. I think it's mostly the UN, UNDESA and um, the, UN, the UNIGF processes with WISIS. And, and, and it has helped us in the long run in terms of getting to agree um, if we are putting this law in place right now, what implication does it have for us as a civil society, as defenders of freedom of, of speech, um, but also for telcos, taking in, in, in the interest of for telecommunications players, um, the government within the national um, uh, interest, the national um, security interest, um, development players in enhancing uh, um, you know, cooperation in general and driving de uh, uh, development in general. Uh, but for us as civil society, for instance, we are able to bring the consent and also bringing in users, everyday use, um, people in the room and, and share the experiences that this is the, ex this is the, the challenges of, of, of we are facing with the laws that we are proposing or the laws that is in, is in place right now. And hence we need to um, repeal it, change it, um, find mechanisms in dealing with it. 
Um, by hearing that ex ex uh, example from Brazil, I think that that um, gives us all hope to say that um, even from um, civil societies, by alone or together, we can um, decide what is best um, for the interest of, of, of nations. Thank you, Ms. Fleming. Thank you so much and, and join, join the army, the fact checking army, right? Uh, very good. I think I would just like to maybe ask, uh, there's one more question that's here. I know that we have almost run out of time, but this is a very good question about how does civil society protect its independence when it has to work with governments on these issues? And I, and I think um, all of us have said we actually do need to work with governments if we're going to uh, address media literacy. Um, I think we heard that it, was a, it could be a national security issue. Um, I wonder if I could ask Solvita to come in and address this. So very shortly, uh, I think that uh, in Latvia, we have the highest level of awareness. And uh, unfortunately, we have such a high level of awareness because of, you know, quite difficult neighborhood we live in. And uh, I think that we also have an excellent example of uh, networking and cooperation on both levels formal and informal. And uh, this is what makes uh, Latvia special. And uh, just a short remark on the first question. So you mentioned these innovative solutions. I would add that to any innovative solutions, we should be assured that for big data, we have the small data and we are avoiding toxic fact checking. So we should avoid amplification of disinformation. And this is the core for uh, fact checking and for journalism. That, that uh, absolutely agree. Um, I think the PR of Namibia, Neville Gertzi, has raised his hand. The floor is yours, Excellency. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I want to be brief because I know we are running out of time. But I just wanted to commend everybody for an excellent discussion this morning on such an important topic. I, I think we need to bear in mind at all times that while the media has a critical role of providing information, uh, media is also in the business of, of business. And so what we find is the temptation for sensationalization or sen sensationalism uh, to creep into uh, the the important role of of providing information and maybe the business aspect of that uh, drives that and sensationalism does have the, the possibility often uh, not to provide the accurate uh, information that needs to go out so I just want to share with you a principle that Namibia the government of Namibia has adopted as a formula uh, to help us all become more uh, in tune to develop trust with the audience of media and information. And that is simply that we need to come uh, apply and su subject ourselves more to providing uh, and seek transparency and accountability. Because once we have transparency and accountability to us, that will improve trust in the information that is going to come out of it. And I commend again everybody for uh, the excellent work you are doing. Let's keep on uh, working at it to help better educate our people who need information every day. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Ambassador. And it's great to hear those words uh, from a government representative that you would seek more transparency and accountability. I think everyone would agree that that is certainly what's needed. So very commendable, excellencies, colleagues and friends. This has been a thought provoking discussion today. Um, it absolutely reinforces all of our common determination to try to eradicate misinformation and disinformation. I don't know if we'll eradicate it, but we're going to try um, and to recognize that the key role um, civil society has in that fight. So as the Secretary General said in our common agenda, we must make lying wrong again. The world has changed a lot since the United Nations was established in the ashes of World War II. 
but our commitment to prevent and alleviate human suffering is unfaltering and our battle against misinformation is absolutely part of that work. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers once more and also the co-sponsors of today's event. I wish you all a great day or great evening wherever you are and I look forward to working with many of you in fighting misinformation and bringing more truth and trust into our world.